Dr. Gary Bertless. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, John asked me to talk about a book that uh, Brookings published this week. Uh, it's called Closing the Deficit, How Much Can Later Retirement Help? Some contributors to the book are sitting in the room. I want to spare them any embarrassment, so I won't mention their names. Uh, actually, John was one of the contributors. Uh, Henry Aaron, should he come around, co-edited the book with me, and he wrote or co-authored a couple of the essay. Rich Johnson wrote one of the major essays. Uh, uh, Nicole, Nicole Mesas, if she's here, uh, was one of the discussants. Yes, hello. Uh, and Kathleen Christensen of Sloan uh, got the project off the ground and uh, provided a lot of support for us. Uh, the research in the book was conducted jointly by Brookings, the Urban Institute, and uh, a macro forecasting company named Moody's.com. And our book tried to answer three questions. What are the budget impacts of a rise in the average retirement age? We assumed in doing this exercise that uh, delayed retirement would occur without any change in eligibility rules or benefit formulas, just people retire later with the existing world that we already live in. How can we, how should we uh, make policy to encourage people to retire later? Uh, what would those measures look like? Who would they help? Who would they hurt? And finally, can policies be designed in such a way uh, that uh, they offer humane protection to people who, for one reason or another, find it very difficult to work late in life, either because they have a bad health, uh, they have uh, the misfortune of working in an industry, an occupation, a firm, where layoffs are common because there's decline. 20 minutes doesn't give me enough time to talk about all three of these areas, so I'm not even going to try to. I'm doing my best. <laughs> um, but I will give you some historical background on uh, the longer term retirement trends and our methods for converting the trends that are out there uh, into forecasts of future retirement uh, patterns, and then I'll discuss our results. Uh, there's no reason to keep any of you in suspense, and there's one good reason for uh, telling you what the answer is uh, at the beginning, and that is I might run out of time before getting to it. The basic question we posed was, can working longer solve the country's bar budget problems? And the answer is no, uh, but no with an asterisk. Using the delayed retirement scenario that we uh, looked at, plus the Congressional Budget Office's uh, long-run estimates of the deficit uh, under its 2012 current law baseline, we found that later retirement would eliminate 4 to 7 percent of the deficit in the decade starting 2011. It would knock about uh, 15 or 16 percent off the deficit in the following decade and, uh, and take uh, about a quarter off the deficit in the decade after 2031. Now, clearly, these numbers aren't big enough so that the, de the deficit problem is solved. Nonetheless, uh, they're a pretty big bite out of the problem. In 2040, the deficit would be cut by almost 40 percent by people retiring later under existing rules. Now, the problem here is that no one, including the Congressional Budget Office itself, believed the uh, baseline that I just described to you. Uh, that scenario that assumed that taxes would increase uh, and benefits and, and spending would decline under the terms of the law that was in effect about uh, a year ago today. And uh, very few people thought that all those things were going to happen. So they had another baseline called current uh, law, uh, current policy, excuse me. And under that, the deficit looks a whole lot worse. And under that scenario, later retirement, under the scenario I'm going to outline in a minute, only reduces the deficit over the next uh, 20 or 30 years uh, by about 3 or 4%, uh, which isn't very much at all. So if Americans retire later, uh, it makes hardly any difference to what the outlook is under realistic uh, projection of what the deficit problem of the country is. Uh, now, 
later retirement can have other kinds of effects on the economy and on people's incomes. Uh, it can make a difference to the incomes of people, for example, who do retire later than they would under the scenario currently forecast by the Social Security Administration. Uh, it can mean retirees have higher incomes because in the past they retired later and delayed their claiming of a pension. Uh, the Urban Institute's micro simulation model suggests that some of the largest proportionate changes in people's incomes would occur in the bottom ranks of the old person's uh, income distribution. And that's because educated, affluent people already tend to retire later. So uh, their prediction model forecasts that a lot of the increases in retirement, increases in income linked to that would occur among the lower income population. Okay. so. Everybody in the room, I presume, recognizes that uh, the retirement age in the United States is already increasing. It's been increasing for the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, the Social Security trustees expect that that trend is going to continue. Uh, since the mid-1980s and early 1990s, uh, men in the United States and women in the United States have been leaving the workforce at progressively higher ages. Employment rates in the population past 60 have risen since the end of the, uh, since the beginning of the Great Recession uh, in 2008, uh, we now have higher uh, employment rates among the aged than we did before the recession began. It's the only age group in the population for which that's true. Uh, there's no single best definition of retirement. But suppose we ask the question, what's the youngest age at which 50% of men have left the workforce after age 60. So I'm not talking about young ages, I'm talking about past age 60. What's the youngest age at which we, we have a labor force participation rate among men less than 50%? And this shows the answer. Uh, these numbers aren't perfect. Some come from the decennial census, some come from the current population survey. But you can see there was a big drop from 1910 to about 1990, 91. And there has been some recovery since then. Uh, Obviously, this is a very crude indicator. We can make some very much more fine-tuned uh, measures of what's going on by looking at age-specific labor force participation rates. But they would show essentially the same pattern. There have been some, uh, uh, there were big declines from the 1910 decennial census in uh, participation rates at those ages. And then there's been a recovery since the late 1980s, early 1990s. There's been a turnaround with a bigger turnaround at the oldest ages. Uh, and the same pattern can be seen for women. Uh, we don't, unfortunately, have decennial census data for women that are quite so good. Uh, but uh, there have been, been rises in, in employment rates and labor force participation rates for some time now. So let's turn to modeling how this trend might continue in the future under alternative projections. The Social Security trustees already predict that the trend underway will continue. This assumption is baked into their estimates of what future Social Security outlays will be. It's baked into the trustees of the Medicare uh, folks, uh, what health costs are going to be, public health costs. But their assumption is that this trend toward later retirement is going to be quite slow in the future. I'll, I'll show you some numbers in a minute. We're interested in knowing what would happen if the trend is faster, considerably faster than what the Social Security Administration projects. Uh, so we start with a notion of labor force persistence. Uh, suppose there are a thousand people who are at work employed in the labor force when they're 57 years old what percentage of these 1,000 people will still be in the labor force uh, at later ages? Here I have 62, 64, and so forth, up to age 74. You can see the decline. Uh, that blue line uh, is, represents the actual experiences of men who turned 60 in 1975. You can see the continuous declines. And then those other lines show what labor force persistence looked like in later cohorts, people who turned 60 in 1985, in 1995, in 2005. And you can see that persistence rates have increased over time. Uh, the same pattern would be seen for women if I, uh, if, when we prepare these. This shows how much labor force persistence has increased at each year of age from 60 to 79. 
in the period from 1988-1990 at the starting uh, to 2008-2010 at the, at the end. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, at age 65, there's been a 17 percentage point increase in labor force persistence. It's less than that later on, less than that earlier on. But basically, at every age from 60 onwards, there has been an increase in persistence. Uh, in devising a higher retirement age scenario, what we decided to do on the project is to assume that labor force uh, persistence rates are going to increase at every individual year of age over the next 30 years at exactly the same pace as we have seen in the previous 22 years. So just keep these labor force persistence rates increasing in the future. What kind of labor force participation rate do we get? Uh, well, here is the pattern uh, for labor force participant rate, participation rate of men aged 65 to 69. It's estimated with very detailed uh, estimates of labor force participation rate at each individual year of age from 65 to 69. Uh, the numbers, the blue diamonds, are the historical numbers up through 2010. After that, there's Social Security Administration projections in the 2010 trustees report. You can see that our estimates give you considerably higher labor force participation rate in this age group by 2040. Uh, here's the same similar uh, numbers for women, and you can see that basically uh, they're very similar to men. And the reason is the improvement, the increase in labor force persistence has been the same among women as it has among men. There's been really no difference between the two genders on the score. Uh, another way to look at the male numbers that I just showed is ask the question that I asked before, what is the average age at retirement? Uh, where the average age of retirement we define as the first age at which fewer than 50% of males are labor force participants. Those uh, black uh, numbers are the historical ones. The green line is the Social Security Administration forecast for 2011 trustees report. And then the red one is ours. You can see by 2045 we say there'll be an age 69 average retirement age of men based on this uh, assumption. And Social Security Administration says the retirement, average retirement age of men will be about 65. Um, so there isn't, uh, there, there's a considerable difference in how long the average man is, uh, is predicted to be uh, in late, remain in the labor force. This shows what's the percentage increase in total employment, uh, labor force uh, size of the population that's 55 and older. Uh, from 2010 uh, onwards, assuming that everybody who wants to be in the labor force, who desires to be a labor force participant, actually gets employed or actually joins the labor force. Uh, this is the numbers for men and women. Each gender has their own uh, color. Uh, basically, by 2040, the old age labor supply is about 13 or 14 percent higher. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. Uh, this is what we mean by later retirement compared with what is in the official forecast of the Social Security trustees. We don't claim this is the best estimate. We just think, well, this is certainly within the realm of possibility. It represents considerably more old age employment than we see today and than the Social Security Administration forecast. How do we decide who's going to join the workforce? Well, we use the Urban Institute's DynaSim 3 simulation model. This is a model that starts with 103,000 individual people who were surveyed in the 1990 to 1993 Survey of Income and Program Participation. This is a longitudinal survey. It then ages this sample of 103,000 individuals in yearly increments from 1993 up through 2085. Of course, we don't use the 2085 numbers. The, the estimates are derived using behavior relationships estimated in a number of different longitudinal data files. The model integrates many trends and life course changes, uh, first marriage, divorce, giving births, benefit take up, deaths, and so forth, uh, from people's late teenage years until they die. Uh, and it predicts for each year earnings, social security, benefits from a company retirement plan, uh, savings and debt. 
Uh, my Urban Institute colleagues uh, and I estimated the desired change in labor force status compared with the projections of the Social Security trustees. And, uh, and then we said, okay, how, how many people change their status? How many people have earnings? What are the implications for the taxes those people pay, for the benefits they receive when they commence receiving benefits? Uh, uh, now, a big problem is that there's an unemployment rate of about 7.5% right now. That means a lot of people won't get uh, employment right off the bat. Our research collaborators at the macroeconomic forecasting firm gave us estimates of how many people would actually get jobs, given the fact that there's high unemployment and there's only going to be gradual return to full employment. The blue line uh, shows how much desired extra labor supply there is under our assumption of greater delayed retirement. And the red line there shows how many people actually get employed with all this desired increase in labor supply. We have three different assumptions about what can happen. The most optimistic one is everybody gets a job, uh, or almost everybody gets a job. That's alternative one. The second one is uh, there's a lot of extra unemployed people that's concentrated among the elderly themselves. Some of them don't find any jobs. And finally, we say there's, there could be a spillover effect so that the extra old people displace some young people who otherwise would be employed. And this shows our estimate of how the federal deficit uh, under alternative assumptions is cut. This is based on CBO's current law baseline forecast. And you see the trend that I described at the outset of my remarks. It, uh, the effects are cumulative. The increases uh, in labor supply have bigger and bigger effects, and they cut the deficit more and more. Unfortunately, that is not a very realistic uh, projection of what the future deficit is. This is uh, considered a more realistic one. And you can see that the effects never get bigger than about 3.5%. Uh, if you have a realistic estimate of what the future deficit is, uh, it's, it's not a terribly huge impact. Uh, these estimates take into account the extra payroll tax revenue that you get because people are working later, the extra income taxes that are generated because people work later, they have higher earnings, the extra income taxes that come from higher withdrawals from uh, retirement accounts, from Social Security payments, higher premiums that people have to pay for Medicare, uh, and the delays in claiming Social Security benefits. Uh, those delays can reduce uh, outlays in the short run, but in the long run, as people, if people do really delay claiming, as, as we're going to hear from John Chauvin a little bit later, they get higher benefits, and so actually that's something of a wash. Okay, so the deficit effect isn't very big, but let me conclude with a couple of cheerful numbers. The Dynasem model does generate estimates of what the income distributional consequences of these changes are going to be. Uh, and these last charts focus on that, the population between 55 and 79 years old. It's obviously the one that's going to be most affected in its income by delays in retirement. Uh, here I uh, show in uh, blue bars what happens to incomes as a percentage change uh, in 2020. Uh, the red bars refer to 2030 changes. The green bars refer to 2040 changes. and as you can see, that's the population that's between 65 and 69 that has the biggest proportional changes. By 2040, uh, there might be 9% uh, higher incomes. Uh, and a lot of those income gains are going to be received by people who are lower income. Here, I, uh, the Urban Institute uh, divided people by their educational attainment, high school dropouts, high school graduates, and college graduates. And you can see the proportional gains in income tend to be largest for, uh, for the people with the least education, and they're also largest for people at the bottom of the income distribution. So uh, a retirement delay without any change in policy may do relatively little to curb the deficit, uh, assuming we use a very realistic estimate of how big the deficit problem is, but it can nonetheless go a long way toward improving the material circumstances of people who are in these crucial ages, uh, especially around 65 to 69 years old. Uh, and uh, 
So for that reason, and also because the likely effects are going to be in a direction in terms of income distribution that many people would welcome, it still would be a worthwhile, uh, the results are still going to be worthwhile and I think people would approve of them regardless of the small effect on the size of our current deficit projections. So the discussion is Jeff Clemens of UCSD and a former CEPR postdoc. Got to put in the plug? You got to put in the plug. Okay, so I'd like to thank John for inviting me to come back up to CEPR from UCSD and to thank Gary for, for sending me what's a very polished product uh, with three, three full weeks of lead time to prepare my discussion, which is a real, a real bonus by most conference standards. Uh, and also, of course, because this is, this is a book and a finished product, I'm not going to you know, talk about sort of new things to do or anything like that. I'll just try to provide some big picture uh, thoughts on the topic. So this is the first paper at this conference that is focused on the working longer aspect of the kind of, of the conference title. And it has a fairly pessimistic kind of implication for how far working longer can take us in terms of narrowing uh, projected budgetary gaps or bringing down the federal debt. And ultimately, this, this seems to reflect just the sheer magnitude of what's in the denominator, that there's the sort of projected uh, obligations, or as Henry Aaron emphasized, uh, promises that you know, may or may not be payable obligations, uh, is, is simply too large for kind of what look like sort of reasonable projections of trends towards working longer to kind of close that gap. Uh, but so what I want to what I want to do is kind of is kind of pivot in a sense to sort of frame the question in a way that anyone who spent time around John Chauvin has kind of heard the heard the question framed, in which emphasizes that working longer in some sense has to be a major part of the solution, which is to phrase the question as, you know, can, can kind of current lengths of working life finance the full length of actual life, or can, a, can, a 30, can 35 years of work finance uh, a full 80 years of living? Because at the end of the day, between private household and corporate and public budgets, everything kind of has to add up. You have to, you know, you can only consume sort of what you, what you ultimately produce. So as, so as incomes grow, we have a couple of options. We can kind of maintain an existing standard of living and choose to spend less of our, less of our lifetime um, working. But if consumption grows with income and kind of debt accumulation seems to suggest that that's sort of the, the path that people have taken, then if your, lifetime is, if your life expectancy is increasing, you're ultimately going to have to at least maintain the fraction of life that you're working, and which means you're going to have to be increasing the total amount of time that you spend working. And just kind of by way of motivational Examples, the people you know, from whom I've learned the most about the economics of, re of retirement tend to be people who sort of, you know, they'll go nameless for now, but uh, they're people who don't seem to be planning to stop working at any point in their lives. And if you do the math, you know that if everyone followed that path, that the federal budget would probably end out all right and household budgets would end out all right. So on some level, working longer has to be part of the solution. So just, just to put up the figure uh, that Gary showed us that involved the kind of SSA's projections and their projections for for what working longer might look like. I first just wanted to highlight you know, how kind of frightening or disturbing the SSA's projections for working longer are. You know, when you think about how much we experienced in terms of gains in life expectancy at age 65 over the previous 40 years, you know, if we were to experience another four-year increase in how long people were going to spend in retirement, and the kind of participation in the labor force followed the SSA's path, you know, that they're just, it's clearly totally unworkable in any kind of household or public budgetary sense. The concern is that, and this is not a concern about, you know, about the projections, the concern is that the projections might actually be right, not in terms of whether or not they can work, but in terms of the incentives that current policy actually sets up in terms of kind of accumulation of, you know, social security wealth um, in the nature of social security taxation, kind of as people enter, enter their kind of the twilight years of their, of their careers. Something else that I think we'll hear more about in the, in the next paper, just to emphasize that you know, these, these additional years that people are living past age 65 are certainly, they're not years in which we would think that they're incapable of working. So this is, um, this is a figure from a 2007 paper by, by Cutler, Liebman, and, and Smythe, which just highlights that you know, kind of, as time has gone on, the fraction of people at each age who are in poor health has been going on. 
And they seem to have suggestively sort of set up their figure to suggest that 72 may be the new 62, uh, which may be pushing it a little bit, a little bit far, but you know, gets across the basic idea that people aren't just kind of spending longer in a sort of decrepit state, you know, that people are living longer and that they're capable of, of working longer. And so what this brings me to is kind of, I guess, my main sort of comment about, about the exercise that uh, the Gary and his co-authors have done, which is that their, their approach has sort of been explicitly to think about the working longer possibilities in terms of kind of forecasting out existing trends that we've been observing in labor force, particip um, labor, labor force partic persistence. Um, so, but so what I want to highlight with the rest of my discussion is that, you know, is that first there are some, some definite difficulties with this approach, and second, that the kind of explicit sort of decision to kind of leave the policy parameters kind of, kind of to, the, to the side might actually sort of, might be leaving out where the key action ultimately will need to take place in terms of giving people incentives to, to remain in the labor force for, for longer periods of time. So just, just to highlight the difficulties with projecting the trends, and, and this is an issue that's, that's, that's kind of probably apparent to, uh, to most of us in the room, is that you know, when we're talking about sort of long-term developments, these are kind of shifts in the behavior, in behavior sort of across generations, and so it's hard to know if you're seeing something that you should expect to be able to just kind of project forward, or if it's something that does reflect something unique about a particular generation or about, about the culture, which is, of course, particularly difficult in the context of trying to project women's labor force participation because there was such a cultural shift in women's participation in the labor force. What I want to kind of work through in the last half of the discussion is just sort of a refresher on some of the evidence that we have on how po powerful some of the policy levers that are associated with kind of incentives for people who are approaching retirement. Uh, because sort of, I think there's a pretty powerful body of work that's shown that the incentives as they're set up, both in the US social security system and abroad, both in terms of, you know, kind of queued up early and normal retirement ages, but also in terms of the kind of implicit tax rates that people are facing, do in fact drive a fair amount of the, of the retirement behavior that we observe, potentially making it the case that it's, it's just difficult to discuss the feasibility of working longer as a solution to our budgetary problems without focusing on these, these policy issues. And the people who have you know, been associated with some of this work, so David, David Weiss is in the room, so this is, this is um, the figures come directly from, from the Gruber textbook, so they're nice, and, they're nice and crisp relative to the kind of the original old PDF documents from which some of these figures come. But so this, this figure is, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't involve any fancy microeconometric evidence, but to me it's always been sort of one of the most powerful statements that I've really seen in any, in any economics research that provides a su suggestive evidence of kind of the impact that, uh, that the incentives that social security systems and other aspects of, of, of countries' um, tax systems set up really do influence retirement. So what they've kind of plotted out from this, this detailed work that they did in, uh, in a sample of, I believe, 11 countries is just kind of capturing the full disincentive to continue working, you know, after, I believe, age 65, just in terms of what goes on with the accrual of Social Security wealth and with the tax rates that people are facing, and to plot that against the kind of unused labor force capacity of the individuals who have entered into this kind of 65 to 70 age bracket and the strength of the correlation that you observe across these countries with higher disincentives being associated with less work is just remarkably powerful. Similarly, kind of in terms of retirement ages seeming to set pretty powerful cues for when people choose to retire, the kind of cross-country end within US evidence is also, is also quite striking. So this was just an, an example that, you know, that's in the Gruber textbook that I that I've started teaching to undergrads last year, showing kind of what happened to average retirement age in Germany after they they reduced their, uh, their normal retirement age by five years. Normal retirement age goes down by five years. And within about eight years, average retirement age goes down by about five years. Similarly, in the US, there's a nice figure for kind of how the, the queue of the early retirement age at 62 kind of played out in terms of people's kind of labor force exit rates. So in 1960, before the early retirement age you know, came into effect, we see that retirement decisions are pretty smooth through age 62. After the early retirement age comes into place, we get a little bit of a blip, and then by 1980, you know, we have 20% of people making that decision to retire at age 62. So these policy levers are clearly a very kind of powerful piece of the picture. And the one thing in the, 
in the in the in, in Gary's paper that, that I had a little bit of a difficult time kind of wrapping my head around is that it turns out that kind of different different definitions of of average retirement may actually have very different different implications for what you're kind of assuming about the fraction of people's lives that they end up spending in the labor force. And these these figures suggest to me that there may be a significant number of years kind of on the table that are just being shifted around by some of these kinds of cues. And so, but it's a little difficult to compare, you know, in terms of if, if the, so what I wonder is kind of the extent to which the pessimistic conclusion in the paper may reflect that at the end of the day, the kind of amount of people's lives that they're spending in the labor force is, is relatively small, sort of relative to if you did, in fact, get something like a five-year shift in the amount of time that people spend working just as a product of changing the, changing the normal or, or early retirement age. Okay, so just to, to wrap up, in, in the big picture, I think what we can see is that you know, existing policy parameters do in fact create substantial distortions that are working in favor of early retirement. And so it's important that, that we keep these, these in mind when we're kind of both analyzing other distortions, but also when we're trying to get a sense for how much is, sort of, is being left on the table in terms of people's, people's work lives um, and, and what kind of potential policy solutions we might, we might have at our disposal when we, when we address these problems. Thanks. Thanks. Questions? Here, Joanna. There you go. Like that? <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, if I'm getting this correct, um, the, the back of the envelope calculation kinds of things that you're doing are um, just based on the expectation of people naturally working more and uh, policy not changing and so on. And um, it seems like every social security conference that I've been to, the, the kind of point has been how do we get people to work longer so that we can cut benefits without hurting people. And so, um, <laughs> My, my question is, given that you found that uh, working longer helps people and it doesn't reduce very much um, of the deficit, if Social Security, how much would Social Security be able to be cut without hurting people, with, uh, you know, allowing people to have the same amount of life given your projections? Does that make sense? You want to, take, you want to answer now or you want to whatever accumulate? You want, whatever you want. I guess we'll accumulate a little bit. Lisa. I found the projections uh, where you stratify by educational um, level really intriguing and actually understand how if working longer for people with less education um, that I believe that will provide more income. I guess I wonder about the assumptions that underlie that and three things are really stand out. I think the healthy life expectation um, data that Dave Cutler showed have become very much more open and controversial lately with um, new cohorts suggesting that there's a very big plateau possible, if not actually a decline. So those healthy life expectation data, I, don't, I think, are, are subject to some query. Um, when you look at life expectancy for women, it's virtually stagnated since 1980 and led to a National Academy of Sciences panel on what led to the stagnation in life expectancy. So we're now at the bottom of all OECD countries. So the story for women is likely to be very different. And the data for um, people with less education and mortality is grim, whether you actually believe that they've lost years, absolute years, or whether they've just um, kind of stayed the same. In any case, like the, the projections are pretty dire. So I guess the, the issue is not, like, not the question of if they would work, would they earn more? They would. Would they be better? But is there really any realistic possibility that among lower educated people, they're likely to have those op opportunities or the skills or the health kind of capital to be able to do that? Uh, Bridget. So I had the, the dubious task of chairing the last social security tech panel where we uh, spent a lot of time discussing what we were going to recommend for the projections about future labor force participation, and which doesn't mean that I'm going to take credit or blame for, for the SSA uh, projections that were on Gary's slides. But the big unknown in the discussions we had was what was the impact of the Affordable Care Act going to be on 
work incentives for older employees going forward. And uh, you know, as the chair of the panel, I was in the difficult position of, of having to decide how firmly I was going to adhere to my own past research, <laughs> which, which suggests that one of the reasons, not, you know, not the only, not, I'm not even going to suggest the primary, but one of the reasons uh, older individuals stay in the labor force is to keep their health insurance coverage until they're eligible for Medicare. So health care reform, which makes health insurance uh, affordable without pre-existing condition exclusions um, to individuals should they retire before 65 could lead to you know some sort of a reduction in this in this uh, either in the growth of the trend uh, or even a reduction in labor force participation at, at older ages so I think I think that's the big question um, I think an, a, another issue that might be worth thinking about and I'm, I'm not the one to do it but um, you know, I was interested by Gary's numbers on, on the financial benefit to, to working longer. Um, and someone in this room, maybe Laura, who I haven't met, but I'm at least a little familiar with what her center does, uh, can speak more to, to the cognitive benefits of working longer. If there are cognitive benefits of, of working at older ages, how would that play into thinking about the advantages of public policy that would, that would delay retirement? Uh, Bob and Steve. Bob. Yeah, just a, a question about uh, what you're assuming in terms of the uh, work patterns. Are you assuming that people continue to work full time or are they shifting to part time jobs? And what are you assuming about their salaries to get the projections that you have there? Are you, are you assuming that they keep their current salary or are you assuming that if they shift jobs they may end up with lower salaries? Well, actually, that was my question, too. And so the only other layer to add on to that is any assumption on uh, self-employment. Um, so are, are folks having their own jobs more and more prevalence in later years? Uh, Henry? Uh, Laura? I just wanted to uh, suggest an alternative way of looking at the impact on <coughs> the budget situation. Uh, Gary gave us ratios, uh, how much what proportion of projected uh, debt is reduced. An alternative way is simply to look at the absolute numbers, and the absolute numbers were somewhere in the range of three to four trillion dollars reduction in debt uh, at the uh, end of the period, which is not huge, but it's not trivial either. Um, this is the book. Uh, I'll be glad to take orders. Uh, and uh, in response to the one comment, a substantial part of the book does deal with policy uh, because we did recognize that uh, that was an important part of the story. And uh, on uh, the uh, impact of uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, much of the increase that, Larry, uh, that Gary is describing is after age 65 when people, as under current law, are eligible for Medicare. You want to just hand the mic to Laura? Um, I'm going to have an opportunity to say a little bit about cognition tomorrow when I get to comment on Bob's paper, so I will, will, will say that. Um, uh, but I had a, just a simpler version of, of Lisa's more elegantly <laughs> phrased question, and that is, have you just ran, run these analyses separately for high uh, wage earners and low wage earners? And at my assumption is they might look starkly different um, in the forecast and the projections. I just wondered if you had done that. Uh, Alicia, you were trying to get uh, worded edgewise. Just a really quick question. Wait, wait for the mic. There you go. We are I'm recording. There you go. Thank you. So, Gary, I thought a study that you just published yourself, which showed that most of the increase in labor force participation in the last 20 years was due to improvement in education, both absolutely and relatively, and that that had leveled off. And so, I thought the implication of that work was that you wouldn't expect to see. Uh, big increases in labor force participation going forward. Okay, I think we're going to close off the questions and let you have some answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the first point to make is something that, uh, just to emphasize what Hank said, uh, almost half the book is devoted to policy. I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks that I only could treat one of the three broad topical areas that the book dealt with. And Hank and John Chauvin and Gene Sterling all dealt with policy. 
and policies to change what the future looks like. Um, policy matters, uh, much so as, as uh, you just heard from Alicia does educational attainment. The rising educational attainment of people who are between 60 and 74 over the last 15 years has been terrific. Uh, they just happen to have been a very well gener educated generation. And uh, in addition, that has closed the gap between the educational attainment of people who are currently, certainly in the first half of their 60s, uh, 60 to 67, 68, and people, prime age workers. That has been a tremendous, uh, the gap has closed tremendously, but especially for men, because later generations of men have not gotten an awful lot more education than did the generation that is currently between 60 and 67 years old. Um, but for women, uh, I, I don't think we would anticipate that there's going to be much of a slowdown because w w younger generations of women continue to get more schooling. And so there is still a gap uh, favoring prime age women uh, compared with older women. Uh, and that gap is going to remain for quite some time, just judging by the educational uh, choices that women are making. Why have women's uh, mortality rates not improved? My understanding from uh, Sam Preston is that it's because of the long lags and the effects of smoking. Uh, there were big increases in smoking in the past, and with a long lag, they have effects on mortality. Uh, and uh, those are still working their way through the female population of the United States. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot more going on, but uh, I don't know enough about it to say anything, uh, to say anything uh, more about that. Uh, someone posed the question, how much can we scale back Social Security benefits without actually hurting people because uh, some of the charts in my uh, uh, presentation showed uh, sizable gains in income, uh, especially around age 65, and especially for lower income people if there is indeed an acceleration, or not an acceleration, if the trend toward later retirement continues at the same pace it has for the last 20 or, year, 20 or so years. Bear in mind that a lot of people, even in our projections, are not going to change their behavior. They were, they've been disabled for 10, 15 years. By the time they reach uh, age 65, it's very unlikely their status is going to change. And uh, the Urban Institute's micro simulation model does not gen give them a change in, in their uh, labor force status because they're so far from the cusp of should I join the workforce. They, uh, the model is assigning, uh, a changed labor force status, uh, changed uh, desire with respect to being in the labor force to people who are already on the cusp of wanting, you know, people who are re were retiring relatively uh, near to the time where their, their status is being changed. Um, high wage earners and low wage earners. We, uh, in a lot of research that I did not describe, we do try to focus on, on what's happening to people depending on their educational attainment, what's happening to people depending on what their pre-retirement uh, wage was. Uh, a lot of the gains in old age labor supply have been among well-educated people, and they've been among people who, as they persist in the labor force, are being disproportionately drawn from people who earn pretty good wages to begin with. That's what's been going on so far. So our change, the future change, changes the behavior of a lot of people who have not been retiring later. Uh, they are the ones staying in the workforce longer. My reading of the historical record is that there have been two sources of increase in old age labor supply. One is people take bridge jobs. They stop their career job, they go into another job, and that has increased. However, it hasn't disproportionately increased. In fact, if anything, the gap between part-time and full-time work of the aged versus the non-aged is narrowing over time. Uh, there hasn't been a disproportionate increase in part-time work among the aged. Instead, there has been an increase in how long people are staying in career jobs that they held when they were in their late 50s. Uh, that's suggested by the tenure um, the tenure uh, distributions that we see. Uh, 
I think I'll stop there so we can hear the next people. Okay. Thank you.